Detective, thank you so much for coming in and talking to us today. I really appreciate it. Does it seem like 10 years to you? Not at all. Seems like it happened yesterday. I know you, you talked with Castro just a few days after he was arrested. Yes. What was your first impression of him? He was relieved. He was relieved that it was over. Um, the night he was arrested, we spoke to him the next morning. I believe it was probably mid-afternoon. He had some time to think about it. But in so many words, he was relieved that it was over. Yeah. What, what struck him, what struck you about him during that first meeting? Anything in particular? Nothing that I can think of off the top of my head. Um, he, he was complicit with the interview. He, mm -hmm. he was, um, I believe, some of his facts and some of his, um, some of his uh, recollection of the mm -hmm. things that happened were a little bit different. Um, but for the most part, like I said, I felt like he thought he would, you know, he felt relieved that it was over and that he can move on now. Take me into the mindset of a detective at that moment. When you walk into that room, do you go in with a preconceived idea of this? Is it a completely open mind? How would you describe it? Well, my, I actually thought about it for a couple hours before the interview started. Um, and I took the approach of non-confrontational, non-judgmental. I certainly wanted him to explain to us what transpired in the house for you know, upwards of 11 years um, involving all three girls. Um, I felt like, I needed to be non-judgmental, non and I needed to, to have him explain in his own words what had happened throughout those 11 years. I read where he told you in that first meeting, I know what I did was wrong. Did you believe him? I did. Um, I, I do believe that he, he realized what he had done wrong. I just don't think that he had, he had the wherewithal to to, to get out of the situation he put himself in. But I think that, you know, overall, I do believe that he understood that what he did was wrong. It sounds like, just from reading it from the outside, that he was in a sense of denial as well. One thing he said in that meeting was, these women lived a happy life. We had a lot of harmony that went on in that home. I say denial, or did he, did he really think that was what was going on in that house? I truly believe in his own mind he had thought that. Um, you use the word denial, I use the word delusional. Um, he did minimize some of the things that happened while in captivity, um, but in his own mind, somewhere along the lines, he convinced himself um, that they lived harmoniously together. I understand he also said, these people are trying to paint me as a monster. I'm not a monster, I'm sick. As someone who spoke with him face to face, do you think he was a monster? I think what he did would constitute that um, over the span of 11 years. Um, I do think that um, he was very conscious of the perception of himself outside of, outside of his own house. Um, he expressed some concerns that, you know, he would be construed as a monster. Um, I believe that um, his perception was important to himself. Mm. and how other people per perceived him. Yeah. Was there anything about him that you found sympathetic? No. And I say that because of some of the statements that he made to us during the interview um, where he minimized and he, you know, used words as we lived as a happy family. So those things struck me a little bit differently. Yeah, can you relate some of the other things he said to you, that interview, that, that stick out even now, 10 years later? Well, I did, the one thing that always stood out to me was I had asked him, you know, what was your end game? What, what was your, what was a way out for you? Um, and he looked at me and he said, I'm not a killer. And I was thankful for that. Um, I think everybody involved was thankful for that. Um, I just don't think that he didn't feel as if he could get out of the situation he put himself in. And that's why I said, it seemed like he felt like he was relieved that it was over, that he was finally caught um, and move on. Were you surprised that he killed himself? Yes and no. Um, there were times that while he spent, you know, three or four or five months, I'm not sure the extent of time in the county jail that um, they had some concerns with housing him there as well. 
Um, yes and no. Mm. Here was a guy, I think 10 years later, I think 10 years later, a lot of people still ask this question. Here was a guy who was living in plain sight. He was a school bus driver. Uh, he would walk down the street all the time. His neighbors knew him. Charles Ramsey famously said, we ate ribs with this dude. They all knew him. He played in bands around the area. I understand he was actually handing out flyers to folks who were looking for Gina DeJesus when he knew that Gina DeJesus was being held prisoner in his basement. How on earth did this guy stay under the radar and not get caught for all that time? That's a good question. As far as him handing out flyers, I'm not sure that, that I personally could not confirm that he ever did that. Um, he, he was, he kept to himself. Um, it was a neighborhood where the, how the houses were very close to each other. Um, I guess it's really hard to describe that. Yeah. That's I, a tough question. Yeah. I, let, me, let me ask it this way. And I think it's the same answer, but taking that flyer, you know, part, part out of the equation, this is somebody that Cleveland police were looking for. Cuyahoga County was looking for the FBI was looking for him. And he, uh, he was out here driving buses hanging with neighbors, doing other things in the area. Ten years later, any idea, any sense as to how he was able to hide for that long? It, it almost appeared as if on the surface that he was a loner, that he didn't have a lot of visitors, if any at all. Um, at some point, he lost his job as a bus driver in the city of Cleveland. Um, I think he was very calculated. I think he was very precise in some of his movements. Um, and I, I honestly believe that he was very, very particular about who he would associate with. Has your opinion of Ariel Castro changed at all in the past 10 years? As far as? Just in general, when you think of that, those early days when you spoke to him and, and you saw him as the rest of us did not. Yeah. As you thought about this over the past 10 years, I wonder if, if, if you think any differently about him as an individual or whatever. No. I I wouldn't say I feel any differently about him as an individual. I would say that um, I was able to create a, a rapport with him during the interview. Um, I think the first day we spent roughly six hours together with intermittent breaks. And the very next day I spent approximately an hour and a half to two hours taking a written statement, um, which he had provided in his words, which I thought was um, very instrumental in, in him taking a plea because it wasn't a statement that I had composed. It was in his own words. Um, I think that um, he, the rapport I created with him was important. And I felt as if at some point he trusted to tell me certain things that happened throughout the time that uh, he had the girls in captivity. You're retired now. Correct. Uh, when it comes to your career and, and the cases that you cover, the cases you handled, where does this one rank in terms of importance, in terms of what stays in your mind? At the top, no question. And I was fortunate to work on the FBI Violent Crimes Task Force where we were exposed to a lot of high profile cases. But I would say that this is at the top of the list and second place is a long way away. Yeah. Did the assignment change you at all in any way? It did. Mm, and I've so. talked about that. Um, it, working kidnappings and abductions, um, you try to work those in a timely fashion to get the people returned to their loved ones. This changed me as an investigator because when you work those and, and you work missing persons, um, you, you don't become callous to the situation, but this one gave us hope that, you know, never stop looking, which we didn't. Um, g have hope that, you know, someday we'll find these people that go missing. So this case in particular rejuvenated a lot of the people that I work with, including myself, um, to provide hope that, you know, don't stop looking, that, that they're still out there and uh, continue to look for him and to continue to follow up on everything that, that comes through. 10 years later, is there anything you want folks out there at home to know about Ariel Castro that perhaps they don't already know? I feel as if the investigation was an open book. I feel as if most of the things that um, were pertaining to him became public knowledge. 
Um, there really isn't anything that I can think of that, that I could share with the public as far as Ariel Castro. And how's retirement? It's very good. It's very good. <laughs> I'm enjoying myself. Great. Detective, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yep. Fantastic. Yep.